The Life of Blessed Anna Maria Taiji. Dusk was just beginning to cast its shadows along the narrow streets of the merchant sections of Rome as Madame Dinardi closed the door of the little silk shop. Going to the window, she looked out and watched the sight. There she goes, away from her work here and home to do the housework for those good for nothing parents of hers. Her older sister, who works with her in the shop, responded. Please, don't treat the Gianetti so harshly, sister. Don't forget, they were once people of wealth and position. That's no excuse for their laziness. Anna Maria comes here every day to work for us, and then goes home to work for that lazy pair. They even take the money we give her for her work, and never even so much as thank her. Anna Maria told me that she thinks she's doing no more than her duty by turning over all her earnings to the Gianettis. Fiddlesticks! A pretty girl like Anna Maria should have a few pennies to spend on the little fineries a girl likes. And besides, what right have the Gianettis to be so high and mighty that they can't do an honest day's work themselves? I understand that Louis Gianetti had a fine business when he was in Siena, but he got so heavily into debt that he had to sell all that he had, even his home. He was ruined. He came to Rome with his family during the whole year. That was in 1775 and opened a drugstore, but that failed too. Now he's nothing but a common servant and doesn't work half the time. The family has to get along on what the mother can earn doing housework for people. And of course, the few coins we give Anna Maria help some. But it's all very humiliating for her parents. I still hate to see Anna Maria working so hard and so long. She has so little time for herself. Don't worry about Anna Marie, sister. She finds time to go to the street dances and the puppet show. Half the young men of the Dei Monte Quarter would be willing to make a match with such a little gem. She'll find her happiness. Yes, Anna Maria will find her happiness. Walking along in the Roman dusk, thinking of the dance she plans to attend, or the new dress she will make, this quite ordinary Catholic teenage girl cannot possibly realize that in a few years, God will choose her to be an instrument of his reproach to a proud world and mark her with the gifts of prophecy and mystic experience. Anna Maria will find her happiness, that happiness of total union with her Savior. Our Lord has plans for all of us. In Anna Maria Teiji's case, he will give us an example of how an ordinary person can reach the heights of sanctity by observing the duties of his state. Born in Siena, Italy, May 29, 1769, Anna Maria spent her early years in the obscurity of a poor Italian home. Although she was always a devout child, she gave little token of the holiness that was to crown her later life. Busy with household duties, occupied with her girlish dreams, she lived the normal, healthy life of a Roman child. Her only care was to brighten the lives of the sad couple who were her parents and attempt to make them forget their social ruin. It was not an easy life. Luigi Gianetti vented his bitterness on his daughter, ill-treating her without reason. For Anna Maria, there were long hours at the wash tub of the stove, but none of these labors seemed to reflect her on her beauty. She was the admiration of all the young men of the neighborhood and the delight of the older folk. Frequent Mass and Communion helped Anna to surmount her little daily difficulties and face life with a smile. As soon as she was old enough, Luigi Gianetti determined to make the most of Anna Maria's charming personality. He recommended her 
as a chambermaid in the service of Madame Sarah at the Macarini Palace, where he himself was employed. Here again, Anna Maria became the pet of her mistress and the servants alike. Madame Sarah showered the girl with affection, giving her her old jewelry and cast-off dresses. She showed Anna Maria how to wear her hair in the most becoming style. What necklaces set off her beauty to the best advantage. Anna Maria began to spend more time before her mirror and took greater pains to make herself attractive. But at heart, she was still the simple, good natural girl that she'd always been. The young man destined for her by God was Domenico Taigi, a rough but handsome young porter in the service of the princey Chiki family. It was his duty to take food every day to Madame Sarah, who was a pensioner of the prince. Domenico's eyes could not help falling on the radiant Anna Maria, moving about with a graceful ease at her domestic duties. When he came to the servant's kitchen for the customary glass of wine, he would sit down looking with mute admiration at the girl while she poured out his glass for him. Apparently, his interest in her was returned, for Anna Maria's hand trembled a little as she poured and her cheeks became rosier than usual. The Guianettis had now moved into the Macarini Palace at the invitation of Madame Sarah. Early one evening, the quiet of their quarters was interrupted by a loud pounding on the door. Madame Guinetti opened it to be struck with amazement at the startling sight of Domenico Taigi, dressed at his Sunday's bed, craning his neck at his unaccustomed collar. He blurted out, I love your daughter. I've been looking for a Catholic girl in good health who can do my cooking and bear me children. I have decided on Anna Maria. I want to marry her. Even the gloomy Luigi Gianetti was delighted at the prospect of Anna's making a match with the steady young porter. Within a month, all the arrangements had been made. On January 7, 1789, Domenico and Anna joined their hands and their hearts before God's altar in eternal bonds of matrimony. The scene of the wedding was in the church of St. Marcello in the Corso. The party that followed was an informal gathering of a small circle of Domenico's and Anna's friends. Laughter resounded in the dining room and toast went up round again and again. Domenico and Anna, seated at the head of the wedding table, could only see each other their face fused with indescribable joy. They knew the future would be one of poverty, but they were confident that their love was strong enough to surmount any obstacle, and so it proved. If Anna Maria had bound herself for a life to a man who loved her dearly, she also found that on occasion the man could become a volcano. Although we had many amiable qualities, Domenico was addicted to wine and had a fearful temper. If something is not going so well, he would come into the house furious, and if the dinner were not prepared to his taste, he would snatch the tablecloth and throw everything on the floor. One time, he was about to give one of his children a whipping when the little one eluded him and ran out of the house. In his rage, Domenico sent a chair flying through the window after him. In the face of all his fits, Anna Maria did her best to soothe the volcanic Domenico. She would smile, kiss him, and mildly embrace him. She inevitably succeeded in restoring him to his customary good humor and making him see his unreasonableness. In contrast with this side of Domenico's personality was his genuine and devoted love for his wife. He delighted in giving her jewelry and clothes and swelled with pride whenever Domenico's pretty wife was mentioned. If anyone dared to annoy her, he was quick to take active measures. 
one feast day, as they were walking to church, a young officer who was keeping the crowd in order rudely pushed Anna Maria, who was with child. Domenico, enraged with the insult, took the man's rifle from him and began to beat him. He might have killed him if Anna had not put herself between the two men. Dominico's and Anna's love for each other never waned through the long years of their marriage. Later on, when Anna's prophecies had made her famous all over Rome, the little Taiji home was crowded with illustrious people, including such figures as St. Vincent Pilati, who came to seek her advice. They all had to wait until Anna Maria had attended to her husband's needs before she would receive them. Dominica's soup was more important to her than the prestige of wealthy or exalted persons. Anna Maria is a very devoted mother. One day, little Sophie ran about the room crying and stamping her foot. Her mother had been doing housework, sweeping the floor, when suddenly she saw her mother floating toward the ceiling. Mama! Mama! Come down! Come down! There's no dust up there. Anna Maria slowly descended, coming out of her ecstasy. As she reached the ground, Sophia ran to her and clung to her mother's skirts and cried out. Mama! Why did you scare me like that? I thought you were going to heaven. Anna took the weeping child in her arms. I'm sorry if I frightened you, Sophie. I promise it won't happen again. But there were stars in Anna Maria's eyes. What had she seen? Anna Maria's children were not always frightened in the way Sophia was. If Anna happened to go into ecstasy, they would turn to each other and whisper, Look, Mama is sleeping. The marriage of Domenico and Anna was blessed with seven children. They added to both the poverty and gladness of the Taiji household. In her role as mother, Anna Maria proved a model for the mothers of all ages to come. In this connection, let us listen to the words of our Blessed Lady, who appeared to Anna Maria and told her the path she was to follow to perfection. Know well, my dear daughter, that here below you will have for every one good day, a hundred bad ones, because you must be like my son Jesus. You must be devoted above all to doing his will and submitting your own constantly to his in the state of life to which it has pleased him to call you. Therein lies your special vocation. Later on, when people come to examine your conduct closely, every individual must be able to convince himself that it is possible to serve God in all states and conditions of life without the performance of great exterior penances, provided only one fights vigorously against one's passions and conforms oneself in all things to the holy will of God. Remember, it is far more meritorious to renounce one's own will and submit oneself entirely to the will of God then to perform the greatest bodily mortification. This is how Anna Maria found a perfection in educating her children, in doing her housework, in caring for her husband. Anna Maria's children grew up in the atmosphere of a home that was filled with the everlasting values of Catholic living. Anna saw to it that they learned their catechism and shielded them from anything that might endanger their innocence. Each day had its own little routine of pious practices. A fervent young priest, Father Raphael Natali, had received permission from his bishop to stay with the Taiji family, and Pope Gregory XVI granted Anna Maria the privilege of having Mass celebrated in her home. Anna Maria managed to find room in the crowded dwelling for a small chapel. Here, the entire family gathered for morning and evening prayer and daily mass and meditation. 
In the evening, Father Natale officiated a benediction and blessed the family before everyone retires to rest. Domenico called his home a paradise. But the Dici home was not a monastery. It was a real home, filled with joyous laughter of people at peace with the world. In the evening, there was a blind man's bluff in the parlor, with Anna Maria joining in the entertainment and smiling at Domenico's clumsy attempts to catch one of his little ones in the game. Anna Maria never hesitated to abandon her little exercises of piety if family duties claimed her attention. Domenico mentioned this in his deposition for the degree of beatification. If any one of us fell ill, she lavished every attention on us to the extent of omitting, when necessary, her mass and devotion. Anna Maria was fulfilling Our Lady's injunction to seek perfection in the duties of her state. It seems that not only was Anna Maria a model mother, she was also a model mother-in-law. Later on, when her children had grown up and married, she came to their assistance on several occasions. When Sophia's husband died, leaving his family destitute, Sophia fled to the protection of her beloved mama. Anna Maria cheerfully took in the young woman and her six children, finding room for them somehow and doubling her own work in order to help the struggling family. When one of Anna's sons, Alessandro, married a girl with Navarro and found himself in debt, Anna Maria sent them money and gifts on feast days to help them along. Truly, Anna Maria's happiness lay in helping others. Through her charity, she brought many to God. To follow Anna Maria's growth in holiness, we must now retrace our steps to the first year of her marriage. It is a great feast day in Rome. The bells of St. Peter's clang from their lofty pinnacles. The young Anna Maria walks arm in arm with the husband in the square of the great basilica. A wide grin is on his face as he surveys his pretty Anna, bedecked with the necklaces he had given her. What a picture she is! Suddenly the jostling of the throng of the piazza throws Anna Maria against the servite father, Father Angelo Ferrandi. She modestly excuses herself and moves on, but an inward voice whispers to the priest, Notice that woman, for I will one day confide her to your care, and you shall work for her transformation. She shall sanctify herself, for I have chosen her to become a saint. An interior voice also spoke to Anna Maria that day. When she and Domenico reached home after their holiday, she came to him as he sat in the kitchen smoking his pipe and stirring the embers in the fireplace. Domenico? Anna Maria continued to say, standing near his chair with her arm on his shoulder. I have a great favor to ask of you. Domenico took her hands in his and looked up at her with great tenderness. Anna, you know I would do anything for you. This won't be easy for you, Domenico, but these jewels, the bracelets and necklaces you've given me, I can't wear them anymore. With so much suffering in the world, with the church's lifeblood flowing every moment, I ask myself how I can go about gaily dressed like this. I don't know why I never thought of it before. It just came to me, suddenly, this afternoon. Please, Domenico, let me wear less jewelry and dress in a simpler manner. Domenico's pipe fell from his mouth. He was about to go into one of his terrible fits of temper when he noticed that there were tears in Anna Maria's eyes. Anna, if you really want this so much, you shall have it. Why you don't like to wear pretty clothes like the other women, I don't know. It's enough for me to know that you want it that way. Domenico did not know it then, but the life of a housewife was ending. That of a saint was beginning. The next few days were ones of interior trial for Anna Maria. Then one day, while she was visiting the church of St. Marcello in the Corso, she decided to go to confession. 
when she entered the confessional, she was unaware that the confessor was Father Angelo, who had remembered her voice in the square of St. Peter's. As she knelt to confess, his gentle voice came to her. So, you have come at last, my daughter. Our Lord loves you and wants you to be wholly his. Remember when you bumped in to me in the piazza? An inner voice whispered to me. The voice said, Notice that woman, for I will one day confide her to your care, and you shall work for her transformation. She shall sanctify herself, for I have chosen her to become a saint. Anna Maria determined to expiate her past sins and faults by a life of rigorous penance. Going home, she went to her room and scourged herself until she stood in her own blood. Father Angelo cautioned her that she was a young wife who had had her household duties to attend to. Not long after the humble housewife had begun to follow the path of perfection, a prodigy not recounted in the life of any other saint, manifested itself to her. She was kneeling before the crucifix one day, scourging herself with her disciplined cord, when a luminous disc in the form of a sun appeared before her eyes. It seemed to have its splendor veiled by a curtain. A crown of thorns surmounted the disc two thorns being longer than the other and meeting at the bottom. In the middle sat a woman clothed in the garb of wisdom, her eyes raised to heaven and two rays issuing from her forehead. For forty-eight years Anna Maria saw in the sun the destiny of mankind. At first she could only see the disk indistinctly but as she progressed in spirituality, it became clearer and clearer, unfolding to the poor housewife, who could not even write, saw the past, the present, future events of the world. In the splendor of the sun, she witnessed the sufferings of the papacy during the Napoleonic captivity and the disastrous death march of the little corporal and his troops across the frozen slopes of Russia. She saw the victorious powers of Austria, Prussia, and Russia seated at the council table in the capital of Vienna, parceling out the map of Europe between them. Anna Maria saw and foretold the triumphant entry of Pius VII into Rome on May 24, 1814. The assassination of Father John, Minister General of the Trinitarians, was enacted in Anna Maria's son. She foresaw the death of St. Vincent Strombi and advised him to prepare for it. The state of souls after death was revealed to her that she might acknowledge and admire the infinite mercy and justice of God. Anna Maria's wonderful graces came to her only through her life of prayer and mortification. In one of the numerous visions of our divine Savior with which she was favored, Jesus appeared to her twice, first vested in the splendor of his kingly glory, and then in the sufferings of the cross. He asked his servant in which role she chose her master. Anna Maria, without hesitation, chose the cross, committing herself henceforth to a life of spiritual and physical suffering. Anna Maria's devotion to Our Lady is evident by the miraculous prayer dictated to her by the Queen of Heaven herself. In this prayer, our Blessed Mother's own words enable the one who prays to the voice in the most acceptable manner his or her plea for spiritual or material aid. The Blessed Sacrament was for the Beata a source of endless delight and comfort. She frequently went into ecstasy during Mass. At one time, 
an Irish Franciscan father was celebrating Mass at St. Carlino, when the consecrated wafer left his fingers and went to rest on Anna Maria's tongue. On another occasion, our Lord appeared to her at the elevation of the Mass and cured her of a very serious illness, also giving her the power to cure the sick by touching them with her right hand. It is said that Anna Maria's compassion for the sick even extended to animals. Horses, cats, dogs benefited from her miraculous powers. Anna Maria attempted to keep her penitential life hidden from the eyes of the world. One day, Sophie discovered her mother's discipline cord in the drawer of her kneeler. In her deposition for the beatification, Sophie says, She told me that she made it to whip me when I was naughty, so as not to hurt her own hands. Shortly after, Anna Maria placed herself under the direction of Father Angelo. He counseled her to give firmer direction to her endeavors to attain sanctity. He advised her to join one of the Third Order's secular. Anna chose the Third Order devoted to the Church's most exalted mystery, the Third Order Secular of the Most Holy Trinity. One of the most ancient Third Orders in the Church, it was composed of men and women who desired to sanctify themselves by pronouncing vows of obedience and chastity and by obeying the constitutions of the Third Order while living in the world. It had numbered among its members many illustrious persons, perhaps the most notable of whom were St. Louis, King of France, and Miguel de Cervantes, the author of the famous novel Don Quixote. Taking its ideals and purpose to spread devotion to the Blessed Trinity from the order founded in France in 1198 by Saints John of Matha and Saint Felix, it proposed an entity practical method for the laity to reach perfection. The beautiful investiture ceremony was held at the Church of San Carlino. Father Ferdinand, a Trinitarian, placed the large white scapular with the red-blue cross over her shoulders. Anna Maria started to go into ecstasy. Father Ferdinand, alarmed at the thought of disturbing the service, checked her with a glance, and she received the habit of the secular order of the Most Holy Trinity with great joy and composure. Anna Maria was to become the patroness of the women of the Third Order. In view of the heights she reached by fulfilling her obligations as a secular order, this is understandable. For Anna Maria had to find her perfection not in the silence of the cloister, but amid the busy atmosphere of a large family of seven children and a hasty-tempered husband. That she did find perfection is an everlasting tribute to the spirituality of the Trinitarian Third Order. The little room is darkened and moist with the sultry Roman heat. It is late in the afternoon of June 7, 1837. A Trinitarian bends over the bed of the sick woman and places the sacred host on her quivering tongue. He then imparts to her the general absolution of the order of the Most Holy Trinity. Anna Maria is dying. In a corner of the room, an aged man sits bent in his chair. His heavy frame heaves convulsively as he sobs out his grief. It is Domenico, assisting at the last moments of the one of the world he holds most dear. The past few days has been a series of unending calvary for Anna Maria. She has been unable to move, and sharp pain flashed through her body intermittently. Her great cross is not her own suffering, however, but the knowledge that it is no longer able to help her family. It was Anna Maria who managed to keep the large family going. Father Natale has had to go from house to house asking for food for the Taiji household. The wife of the Governor General Savoy has learned of Anna's distress and has offered to solicit alms for her at the court. Anna refused, saying that she wishes to remain unknown to the world. A slight motion of the dying woman's hand brings the Trinitarian priest to her bedside. May I speak to my husband? Domenico is called. 
He kneels on the floor next to the bed, his sobs still echoing in the little chamber. Anna smiles as she takes his hand. Why do you weep, Domenico? Don't you want me to go to heaven? I shall be very, very happy there, and I shall wait for you. Oh, Anna! Anna! Domenico, I know you haven't had any sleep for the past few nights. Why don't you try to rest? Sophia can look after me. Anna Maria, turning towards her children, continued. Why don't you take the children for a walk on the Corso? The air isn't good for them here. Domenico rises. At the sign of the priest, all withdraw. Before he goes, the Trinitarian bends over the dying woman and asks her how she is. Mortal agonies. These were the last words Anna Maria ever spoke. Two days later, on the 9th of June, 1837, she was dead, clothed in the poverty so loved by her master, unknown to the world, just a little old woman who had raised a family, but who, in doing that with the motive of rearing saints for heaven, had become the greatest mystic of the 19th century. It is the 30th of May, 1920. The bells of St. Peter ring out with jubilant clamor, and thousands fill the huge piazza before the greatest church in the world. Within, the magnificent basilica is thronged with dignitaries and people from every nation. The Vatican Choir's golden harmonies echo to the huge structure. In the sanctuary, rows of red-robed cardinals and bishops add splendor to the scene. Here and there, a Swiss guard, stationed to keep order, may be seen in his brilliant dress uniform. Pope Benedict XV reads the decree of beatification. She did not live for herself, but for others. Christian marriage is a symbol of Christ's union with the Church. Indeed, the Apostle Paul calls it a great mystery. Often, God wishes to show that it is possible, with the help of His grace, to arrive at the heights of sanctity in this state of life, despite the difficulties intrinsic to it. The Most High willed to manifest this through a humble woman who gave a very precious witness of holiness while involved in the cares of married life and obliged to provide a living for herself and her family by the work of her hands. She fulfilled the roles of a perfect wife and attentive mother so religiously that she fittingly has become a brilliant and outstanding model for all wives and mothers. She would rise early in the morning and leave home for a nearby church to nourish her piety and be renewed at the Eucharistic feast. Hardly had the day begun when she would be back at home with her family, dedicating herself zealously to her household duties and carrying out the obligation of her state in life. She bore seven children, four boys and three girls. Some died in infancy. Those that survived showed by their upright lives and morals what a religious and ideal formation they had received. But, busy as she was with her duties in providing for her children, this venerable servant of God was in continual meditation on the things of God. Having turned her home into what appeared to be a shrine, she did not escape insults and slanderous remarks. These she bore fearlessly for the love of Christ, forgiving those who offended her and returning good for evil. She was so inflamed by the love of God that she had difficulty in keeping it hidden. Although absorbed by the fire of divine love and being taken up with Christ, it cannot be said that for this reason she was not attentive to the needs of her neighbors and to the events which affected the city of Rome and the society of her day. She experienced poverty in her own life, 
yet she never lost an opportunity to come to the aid of the poor. Because of her immense love of God, she would offer herself up as a victim to God's justice, eager to prevent impending disasters through her ceaseless prayers. The people looking up at the huge paintings suspended over Bernini's altar see not a founder of a religious institute, not a nun or a priest or a brother, but a simple housewife dressed in the usual Roman daily attire, distinguished only by the Trinitarian scapular. The picture shows the home of an ordinary Italian laborer. The woman is depicted as if caught in ecstasy before a brightly burning sun, as her children work and play around her. Anna Maria, mother of a family, has been raised to the altars of the Universal Church as Blessed Anna Maria Taiji. Blessed Anna Maria Taiji's life is a challenge to today's teenage girl, wife, or mother. As a young girl, she never failed to give her parents the respect and love due to them. She helped them by her industriousness and thrift and lightened the burden of their old age. As wife, Anna Maria devoted herself entirely to her beloved Domenico, trying to make his hard life easier, seeing to his comfort, considering him as a superior, and giving him her utmost confidence and love. As mother, she supervised the children's education, instilled in them a love of cleanliness, order, and hard work, and shielded them from vice and bad companionship showering upon them the abundance of her motherly love. It was under the direction of the Third Order of the Most Holy Trinity that the saintly expatriate attained her unique spiritual stature. Anna Maria was always proud of her intimate association with the work of the Trinitarians. They, in return, had proclaimed her patroness of the Third Order and are promoting the cause of her canonization. Let us offer our fervent prayers that they may be successful and that Blessed Anna Maria Taiji may become a source of inspiration for the women of the modern world. Pope Pius IX, in the degree for the introduction of her cause, pointed out her role in the history of mankind. Her mission was to humble in the dust the pomp of the world and to outwit the schemes of the wicked to which God opposed, as it were, a rampart in the form of a lowly woman. Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, pray for us. The Trinitarians, 800 years of service to God and humanity. The history of the Church is the history of a love relationship between God and His people. All throughout this relationship, God has shown a particular love for those who suffer and a special care in times of distress. Such times mark the end of the 12th century when Christians and Muslims were endlessly at war for the control of Southern Europe and the Holy Land. Those were times of violence and confusion, of social upheaval and ruined economies of destroyed families, and of numberless prisoners of war who were held in captivity. It was then, in the year 1194, when God in His love inspired a man, John de Matha, to found a new and original religious community in Paris, France. John de Matha felt deeply the pains of the Christians kept in bondage by the Muslims. His revulsion for human servitude and his love for God Trinity led John to call his community the Order of the Holy Trinity for the Ransom of Captives, or the Trinitarians. The earliest Trinitarians first raised funds, then, braving pearls and risks, they would embark on ransoming missions throughout the slave markets of North Africa and the Middle East. Upon returning to home ports, the Trinitarians were confronted with the challenge of providing 
physical and spiritual assistance to those who had been freed. This they did by establishing hospices and hospitals, which they managed with the help of the lay Trinitarian organizations. Their mission accomplished, the friars would return to their monasteries to live and pray with their fellow religious, while other Trinitarians prepared to undertake other ransoming missions. During the next 500 years, the order grew vastly throughout Europe. In the 15th century, the Trinitarians joined the historic voyages of Vasco de Gama, de Soto, and Cortes to bring the faith to the New World and to India. Among the great and the notables involved with the Trinitarians was Cervantes, the great Spanish writer of Don Quixote. He had been captive for five years when he was freed by the Trinitarians. Thomas Jefferson, as ambassador to France, also enlisted the aid of the Trinitarians to free 21 American seamen captured by barbarian pirates. Rescue efforts were thwarted due to the outbreak of the French Revolution, but the order's greatest glory is the score of Trinitarian men and women whom the Church recognizes as saints, blessed or venerables, for having lived an intensely holy life or died as martyrs. This is but a sampling of the history of the Trinitarians, a history of 800 years of courage and dedicated service to God, to His Church, and to suffering humanity.